muscle wasting and the loss of muscle strength is not necessarily just an automatic function of chronological time. The main thing that causes the aging of muscle is disuse, it just sedentary living and not using it. The, the whole use it or lose it principle is, is a very, very real thing. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Alan Aragon. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Rick. Everything's good <laughs> around here, man. I bet it is. Listen, I've been a long-term follower of yours. I, I, we were talking pre-podcast. I think I subscribed to the Alan Aragon Research Review probably when you started, which was what year? 2008. Yeah, Lee. Well, listen, in case someone out there that's listening or watching has been living under a rock, Tell us who in the heck is Alan Aragon. Tell us your background (laughs) and currently what you're up to. Sure. I'm a regular guy, just average and in all ways imaginable. Um, I just would like to think I outwork a lot of people. (laughs) I would like to think I outwork even Lane Norton. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) What's up? What's up, Lane? Um, So... What I'm best known for is being one of the folks on the vanguard of the evidence-based movement in the fitness industry. So um, me and like a handful of other folks tried to convince people that, hey, we need an evidence-based approach. In other words, we can't just go on hearsay and anecdote and advice from the the most um, well-built person in the room and uh, we can't just listen to to any sort of authority figure we we need some kind of a scientific basis for learning practice guidelines for getting results for getting ourselves results getting our clients results and so this was gosh going on going on 20 yeah right about 20 years ago when the fitness industry didn't really have that strong um science based approach. And when I say science-based, I'm talking about just in, in including the the valid empirical stuff in the field as well, because we can't just wave around PubMed abstracts and say, hey, look at this study. Therefore, this is the way it needs to absolutely be done. You know, it has to be a combination of field observations and research. So the, the two areas kind of cross check each other. So they kind of keep each other uh, in line. And so that, that was the whole thing with the evidence-based movement started about 15, 20 years ago. So myself and gosh, possibly a couple other guys worth, worth mentioning, uh, Will Brink, Joey Antonio, Brad Schoenfeld. I mentioned Lane. Lane is a little bit younger, younger generation. He's sort of our child. He's our, our, our love child. Um, (laughs) I'm going to spend, it it appears that I'm going to spend most of this podcast ribbing lane, but I, I just, um, I just hung out with him at the nutritional coaching summit put together by Jeff Phillips and, and his guys who are, you know, they're a great group of guys. And so, yeah, I got, I got a bit of lane on the brain there. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's the origins really. I helped usher in this evidence-based movement, which now is very kind of almost a matter of fact. It's, it's like when you make a nutrition claim, people go, okay, well, you know, the people <laughs> in certain circles, in the circles we run around and we go, oh, that's an interesting claim. What's the evidence for that? And it's a good faith question asking, hey, is there anything beyond something you read on a random blog post? Or is there anything beyond something you're favorite guru said in an interview. Um, And so, yeah, that in a nutshell, man, that that's me. And so I was a personal trainer for the first decade of my career. I was a nutritional counselor for the second decade of my career. And the past 10 years have consisted of research and education. And of course, a a little bit of client work. I try to keep one foot in the trenches so I don't lose touch with the, with reality, you know? So yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, I will tell you that, you know, from my lens to your point, we're not we're not suffering from a lack of information, right? These days, we certainly are not. And you know, if 
speaking like how I see you in the industry is you're that trusted source, right? I don't know anyone else who disseminates all valid research can actually understands how to, how to read research. First of all, right. Who's supporting it? What's it motivated by? Is it a valid study? Is it not? And disseminate all of that and filter it and then say, okay, here's the body of research along with the empirical evidence of what we're seeing. So here's what we're seeing, right? And report on that accurately. So for me, if, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm as susceptible as anyone, we all are to emotional, you know, biases and reading something that like kind of backs up what we feel, you know, what we like, you know, whether it's something to eat or exercise or whatever that may be. But if I'm really like, well, I'm not really sure, I will always go to your page, dig around and look through your research. Um, and you've got a good feature on your site indexing where I can find things. And, and see like, okay, what's Alan say? Because I know it's not your opinion. You've always taken a very um, pragmatic approach and you're like, listen, here's what the research is showing. Here's what the empirical evidence is showing us. Here's here's what I think. Here's what we think is going on, right? Um, in a very unassuming, uh, maybe not unassuming, but not an aggressive way. You know, you don't have, what I always appreciated about you, and this is what I always tell everyone, there was no one in your pockets, right? You weren't supported by or sponsored by. And so I could trust yeah. and trust is, in, is a currency these days in such low supply from politics to government entity, you name it, right? Anything. And so, um, you know, to, to go to someone who, you know, is not beholden to anyone who's giving you the real information, who understands how to read it and will present it in a way um, that I, I think it's invaluable. And so that's, that's what I've, I've always seen for me has been the thing that really differentiates you. Now you kind of sold yourself short because you, you recently published a book called flexible dieting. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah I've been, been okay, doing a man. bunch of Pub bunch of publishing late, lately. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, publishing articles, um, research, obviously, and then uh, flexible dieting. You wrote an entire. I don't know if you call it a book, but uh, it looks like a book on just protein alone. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I wrote an ebook on protein. Uh, just as a little gift to the the research review subscribers. And by the way, I want to thank you for having been subscribed since two thousand eight and. Having followed my career for as long as you have, I mean, you followed my career before 2008, which is really, really awesome. Um, and it it really does validate all the the hard work and the gray hairs and the str stray hairs and <laughs> um, <laughs> in the late nights. It, it really does validate it and really does motivate me to keep keep doing what I'm doing. When I see folks like yourself who are just shining professionals in the field who are pushing um, the field forward and, and just raising the game and, and, and making a, a really positive impact on the community, both, you know, locally, regionally, globally. Um, I think it's, it's amazing. It's amazing well, to see that. So I, yeah. Well, thank you. And it's important to me because, you know, every, like, like we said, trust is in short supply. It's a currency these days. It's important to me that any information that I would give to, you know, what used to be our, our global licensing now full on franchising. It's like, I want to make sure that anyone that we give the nod to, so to speak, or say, hey, this is your guy. Like if you want, if you subscribe to the Alan Argon Research Review, right? It's one of my favorite th things to look at that's like deep dive into the industry. If I'm honest, I spend most of my days in a boardroom talking about legal stuff and you know, franchising franchising, right? But when I want to dig into the thing that we do and nerd out on it, you're the first place I go. And so we always tell everyone, and for the very reasons I said, this is your trusted source. He's not beholden to anyone. He's just presenting information. He's not biased at all. And he presents it in a very calm and unassuming sort of non-aggressive way. So it's just very trustworthy. So again, I could just sing your praises all day, but for anybody listening, you know, alanargon.com, I believe, right, is the site. Mm -hmm. and we'll post all That's that right. after the show. But, like, if anything, you guys subscribe to the newsletter. I don't even know what it costs these days, but it's probably worth 12 times that. So <laughs> go and subscribe. And it's something that you can you can have your team have a look at, you know, or have them subscribe as well, probably better yet. And uh, listen, if you want – we're at the front lines. And if you're running, say, an alloy location – you know, you're responsible for those customers. And Alan does a ton of research on not only, you know, nutrition, but exercise as well. And that was my next question for you. How did you, how did you decide to 
um, really want to dig in. I mean, I, like it sounds horrible, honestly, like here's 80 <laughs> studies that I personally read, which is probably why you're <laughs> up all night, right? And here's <laughs> right, what I'm right. seeing, right? About like post-exercise nutrition timing, whatever the things are, whatever made you want to do something like that? Because quite honestly, it sounds yeah. horrible. I'm so thankful. <laughs> <that> it <sounds laughs> it's, it, I, I tell you what, it, it, it's kind of like a game, you know, it's, um, it's a game of trying to figure out uh, a mystery. So if you were to just sort of imagine like a detective just kind of, you know, trying to find out how, how do we un unravel this mystery and the payoff at the end of finding out the misery, <laughs> the, the misery, the mystery and there. Yeah, there is mi there is misery Whoops. in there. Uh, that <laughs> Freudian slip was really actually quite legit. Um, the payoff uh, of solving the mystery is potentially applying um, what you learn to getting a little more jacked, getting a little more lean, getting a little more healthy. And so that's sort of the, the, the golden carrot kind of dangling there at the end, at the end of the, at the end of the tunnel is okay, let's walk through all this mud and you know, we might find, find the answers along the way that will lead to this sort of this, this glorious uh, discoveries, you know? So um, it, it might be a little insane, but <laughs> that's kind of the, <laughs> Look, that's man, kind of the You're the only one I've ever known to do it. And I so appreciate it. And uh, that's part of the selling point when I'm talking to people like, what is it exactly? I'm like, well, imagine reading all of the research or the main body of trusted research in a certain area about one topic. And then, you know, yeah. writing a summary of it, like a man, they're like, Ooh. I'm like, exactly. Right. <laughs> Subscribe to the newsletter. Like you're never, you're never yeah. going to get this information from anyone else. Cause no one's crazy enough to do it. Um, well, you know, Rick, like, Rick, we just published this, this paper on intermittent fasting. Uh, and topic. this, this was published, uh, this last week, a little one to two weeks ago. Um, and, and it's, I wanted to write the end all paper on intermittent fasting as specifically how it affects body composition. So how it affects muscle gain, fat loss. Um, and inevitably we have to talk a little bit about health in the process. It's hard to separate health from body composition, but, um, that's kind of the, the, the big deal right now is the publication of that paper. And, um, also recently prior to that, um, my colleague and I, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, we, we wrote a paper on age related muscle anabolic resistance. So talking about things like sarcopenia and, um, you know, mitigating, preventing age related muscle loss and stuff. And so, um, th those publications, hopefully, you know, since they're open access, um, hopefully they, they kind of make an impact and, and make a ripple. You know, I, I, I love the research review and I wish everybody would subscribe to it. It's only 10 bucks a month and it's, it's Still? and it's never, yeah, it's never gone up to much to the, I was about to say uh, that was, that was what it was in, in 08. It would be nuts not to subscribe <laughs> yeah. at that price. Oh yeah. Yeah. Much, much to the disappointment of my wife saying, what, what are, are you working for charity? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and um, yeah, my, my wife is the business minded one. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the artist. <laughs> yep, I'm the science, right. si the science and, 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 and uh, artist, but there's a bunch of good, good stuff to, to be learned. And um, I'm just very passionate about writing about it and teaching it. And so, um, yeah, I've got I actually have a, a webinar coming up on January 21st. I'm not sure how soon that this episode will, will hit, like the, hit the airwaves two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So, time. so yeah, it, that's, that's going to be in January 21st. So anything having to do with learning this stuff and teaching it. And, um, of course, like, as you know, you know, we got to, put it to practice and walk the walk and be the, <laughs> be the force that we want to see. Um, it's just, it's all good. And so the treachery of the late nights and digging through PubMed, it, it's just kind of part of the, the whole game for me. 
Well, it's really cool to hear that like you're also doing it out of a personal passion, right? Um, I agree. I think you, I agree with your wife. You should definitely raise your rates. I apologize to any listeners that are already subscribers, but it's, it's <laughs> such, so much value for $10 a month. I mean, it's nuts. You should definitely raise your rates, but I, it, I appreciate nice that. Man. Thank you. Well, Thank you. and as you know, that. like having a big enough why will, will get you to do those late nights and dig through those articles and stuff. And I, I figured that would be the case just based on, you know, how, how long you've been consistently publishing this amazing content. So I'm glad to hear that. Listen, you said something about, I, I did read your article on aging sarcopenia. Um, I wanted to talk to you about that. I saw a really cool post that you made. I'm, I follow all your stuff, of course. So I, I think it was on Instagram, pretty sure. It was your father-in-law. And you showed a video of him uh, attempting like a body weight squat maybe 12 months ago, right? Mm -hmm. And then you contrasted that with a year later. And he was doing like elevated uh, dumbbell squats with amazing yeah. depth, great form. And he's like mm -hmm. in his 80s. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. loved it. I thought it was, and it was well, you know, well written what you wrote about it. But I'd love to dig into that. As you know, our customer avatar for personal training, because the price threshold pushes us a bit older, you know, listen, 70% of the nation's disposable income lives in the 50 plus category. So it's not a bad market to go after. Um, what are you seeing specific to that market? It's a broad, broad question. I get that, but we can dig in um, as it relates to strength training specifically or exercise, right? Protocols. Yeah. And, and maybe then we can transition from there into nutrition as well. Is there a, mm -hmm. is there any special needs in this population, which by the way, I'm in, and apparently I found out you were as well. So <laughs> what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, that's a big, big topic and I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, oh, and by the way, speaking of that post that you mentioned, it just hit 3 million views today. Wow. Three so it wasn't just me. Views. Everybody loved no, it. No, dude. Dude, it was It's awesome. a genuinely viral post. My my wife actually put that post up and um that yeah, yeah, it, it's on my wife's page and we're just sitting here stunned because it's got close to 200,000 likes. I mean, Six digit what? likes on an Instagram post is unheard of unless you're like one of the Kardashians or something. Yeah, well, maybe, exactly. maybe not after the Balenciaga scandal, but <laughs> exactly. you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, man, almost 200,000 likes, 3 million views. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the whole statistic that the, that older adults are the fastest growing population um, worldwide, it really kind of um, comes to light with with the, the, the this type of post going viral. It really shows that there is a need, and people have a lot of hope, you know, in in the idea that they don't have to call it quits just because they have some grays up top or full blown white up top or nothing at all up top. You know, <laughs> you don't have to call it quits, and the. The paper that I did with Brad, when we looked at all the research on this topic, one of the most fascinating things was that it sounds like an exaggeration that it's never too late to start training and getting the benefits from it, but it's not an exaggeration. We're talking people in their 80s and 90s picking up weights, doing resistance training and rejuvenating muscle from the cellular level all the way up to the the macro morphological level of just muscle strength and hypertrophy. It can happen. Gosh, maybe right before you're about to take your last breath, see if you can do a curl and you know, you get some freaking benefits <laughs> out of that. It's, it's, it's really quite incredible. There's, there's no um, point where the adaptations to external loads or just even body weight load, um, and the, the training effects, the, the myriad physiological benefits of training effects can happen, man, boy, well, until uh, easily into your 80s and 90s. And so what that tells us is that when people are turning 40 and they're sort of having this mental shift that, oh, no, I'm 40, I'm old. Um, that's kind of the, the beginning of, of the end if, you, if that's the attitude that you'll take on because then you won't necessarily – carry out the behaviors that somebody with a whole different perception has. I think we need to change our perception of age, um, middle age, especially because a lot of athletes, 
And um, a lot of people can actually become recreational athletes in middle age and, and in older age, because muscle, muscle wasting and the loss of muscle strength is not necessarily just an automatic function of chronological time. The main thing that causes the aging of muscle is disuse, Uh, just sedentary living and not using it. The the whole use it or lose it principle is is a very, very real thing with the musculoskeletal system and, and in turn the cardiovascular system. And so if we can convince people that, hey, even if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, who knows, 90, Usually by the time people get their 90s, they're ah, screw it, man. I'm I'm tired of this crap. <laughs> That's right. Um, but but yeah, I mean, if we can convince people who cross over into middle age that hey, this is prime time. This is prime time for you to train and and make those make those improvements, get those positive adaptations, body composition wise um, and health wise, and people don't people really underestimate the positive effects of training on on cognition. And on brain health, um, it you know they they really complement each other, and, and so when people begin to realize the possibilities of that, then they can start acting on it. And yeah, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. You know, I, I'm we moved into a new neighborhood when my youngest went away to college, which was like four years ago, and you know, I was hanging out with some of my neighbors, and you know, we were talking beforehand. Like I think you and I are both in one probably at a stage where I'm almost in better shape now than I was in my twenties. Right. Um, kids are older, so I've got more time, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm in pretty good shape. And so I'm talking to one of my neighbors and he's like, you know, we're having a business conversation and he says, um, and he's my age as well. Um, and he goes, you know, you know, Rick, you're, you're pretty smart. And he said it like I like <laughs> in a way that made me think. Mm. And I go, well, why would you say that? Like that's a, that's a terrible thing to say. And I laugh. And he goes, well, you know. And he kind of puffs himself up, like he's muscular, right? And it's so funny. It's like it's certainly in our age bracket, maybe it's changing. I don't know. You know, people would look at someone who's you know, I'm just air quoting jacked or whatever that may be, and there's just an automatic connection to like this person spends all their time in the gym and they're not smart. When in fact. There's no science that will show that your <laughs> cognitive function and brain function is not light years better if you exercise. And this is a great guy. He's a gregarious, fun guy, but he's way overweight and he maybe hits a golf ball around a couple of days a week. That's it. Yeah. Right. And I'm yeah. thinking, yeah. okay, but that stigma is still there. So it reminded mm-hmm. me of that story for sure. What, You're pretty what smart about, for a jock. Yeah. For a dumb weightlifter guy. You're pretty smart. You know, I'm like, well, geez, thanks. Um, what about protocols for strength training for this age group? Is there a frequency? Is there a sets and rep scheme? Is there anything specific that you've seen with your research that's better than, than anything else? It really varies on, on the person's training history. So the person's training age and training status. So you kind of meet the person where they're at. Um, and and the, the spectrum ranges from somebody who's been pretty active and athletic throughout their whole lives and or at least physically active and progressively training and and really putting in a high level of effort for at least several years. So you have that population to where, okay, what's your goal? Is your goal to kind of casually maintain or are you still trying to push the envelope? Um, So if if we take, uh, I'll, I'll just use myself as an example. So um, I'm 50, I'm going to be 51 in gosh, like less than a month. And so my goals are to keep putting on muscle. I just want to take up a little more space, you know, who knows, maybe childhood <laughs> trauma, maybe skinny points in, in my childhood just really got to me. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I want to put on more muscle. And so, so therefore I basically would follow the standard prescription for muscle hypertrophy in terms of uh, training volume, in terms of lifting volume. And that prescription is, okay, very, very roughly for intermediates inching towards the advanced and stuff, it's roughly 10 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. And I say 20 sets very carefully when I, when I talk about that range, because most people, honestly, most people, if you're putting in, the right effort 
into your training, you'll kind of your, your joints and your, your body will kind of beg for mercy right around like 12 sets per muscle group per week, honestly, for most people. Um, there are other folks who don't really push sets very hard. They leave a whole lot of reps in the tank per set and then can just do a lot of volume, do like 20 sets per muscle group per week. But for most people putting in a bunch of effort intermediates, um, maybe higher level intermediates, we're looking at um, a, a total volume of roughly right. 10, 12, I don't know, occasionally right. 15 ish uh, sets per muscle group per week and frequency per week. It's, it's um, like logistically, it's, it's not very feasible to get it all in, in, in one session per week. When you're talking about per, per, for a single muscle group, it's a whole lot easier to break it up into hitting the muscle groups at least twice a week, because then you can divide that volume out a little bit better, whether you hit it with, you know, four, four sets per training bout or six sets per training bout or eight sets per training bout for a given single muscle group. Um, it, it's a little bit, you know, more feasible to do it that way. So that would be kind of the prescription tent. 10 to 12, some would say even 20 for the advanced folks. So total um, of, of total sets, total work sets per muscle group per week and the frequency by which you achieve that 10-ish potentially of 15, 20 sets. The frequency in the course of the week that you would hit that is at least twice. I mean, there are some folks who do hit a muscle group just once a week and stay in the gym for two hours right. and do like 15 sets or whatever. You know, do like three, four exercises, you know, a bunch of sets per, per exercise. And then, and then just do that one day a week. That was kind of a thing for bodybuilders, uh, back in the nineties and stuff, but, um, it's a lot more efficient and actually effective if you can spread that out a little bit better. So, so that's one population. Okay. So we're talking about, um, guys like right. myself and I'm going to make the leap that you and I aren't terribly different in terms of our training status and training age. And so um, I'll, I'll talk now about the rank beginners or the folks who just kind of, it just hit them now at, at 40 or 50 that, oh crap, I need to start training. I need to start doing something so that I'm not in a wheelchair by the time I'm 80. And so um, for those folks and for, you know, for, for, uh, for younger folks as well, but if you're coming straight off the couch, mm -hmm totally untrained or completely deconditioned, then the minimum effective dose for making progress is very, very low, man. I mean, um, it's a recent paper that, that uh, my friend Brad Schoenfeld and, and his colleagues put out looking at minimal effective dose. And we're talking three to five sets per week, per muscle group wow. per week in order to in order to make progress from a, um, an untrained state and that three to five, three to six sets for the, for the, for per muscle group for the whole week, that also translates to maintaining an average healthy amount of, of strength and, and mass. So it, it it's when you really kind of want to go a little bit beyond average that you'd start creeping into the 10, 12 sets per week and beyond. Right. And, and yeah, yeah. So that's the long winded answer on training. No, that was, that. thank you. Yeah, that was perfect. And I, I mostly liked it because it's what we prescribed. So <laughs> thank you. Oh, good. We're not good. Blowing you're you're on top of the research. The then. Like, good. Here's the world's greatest expert. You're like, ah, do it this way. I'd be like, Oh, that's not good for alloy. <laughs> but no, uh, to your point, <laughs> to your point, um, you know, we, we get people in two to three days a week. I mean, you know, mostly our customers, they're busy, they're entrepreneurs, they're, you know, our, our archetype, if you will, the main one's called mover and a shaker. So you think about someone who's like you, who can probably control their own schedule, they're entrepreneurial, you know, they're maybe smarter than the average bear. That's the type of customer that we attract, which is great. It's a, it's a, you know, an A player, if you will, in a, in a certain age bracket category. Mm. But those individuals, they may not love exercise as much as someone like myself or you or as someone that's mm -hmm. in the industry. So if we can get them two to three days a week, right, um, we're happy. The three days a week is is the ideal two is enough. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, we do very similar. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, just a sort of a movement pattern based, you know, scaffolding, if you will, around exercise. But we mm-hmm. end up with that 12 to 15 sets per muscle group. If you look at it that way per week, and it seems mm-hmm. to be enough to produce the results needed without being so much that it beats people up to your point. Like it's not CrossFit or something, right? We're not just going to destroy someone. Um, and not saying CrossFit's all bad, but it typically is a bit much for most people in this age category, especially if they haven't exercised. So I'm really yeah, glad to hear yeah. that. Let's um let's talk about nutrition and specifically protein. And I know you sure. you wrote a specific paper for us. So it's a hot topic. Is it true that this age bracket, 45 to 65, do we have special protein needs? Do we process assimilate proteins differently. Tell me what you know about 45 to 65 active or not, maybe both. What do we need to do with our Mm -hmm. protein? Yeah. Protein is, it it can be broken down pretty simply. Um, the general population, depending on what, what, you know, observational research you look at, uh, they range anywhere from a little bit below the RDA to a little bit above the RDA. So um, I've seen as low as 0.9 grams per kilogram of body weight that the general pop consumes, but then there's some newer research. Um, thank you, Simon Hill, uh, showing that, um, 1.3, 1, 1. 1.0 to 1.3 grams per kilogram is their intake. Uh, however, when you increase protein significantly above that, so like double the RDA. So the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight and double the RDA at 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, which is about 0.7 grams per pound. When you increase your protein to that, then you start realizing um, benefits towards not just health, but body composition and um, exercise performance and strength. So I I don't subscribe to the idea of a minimum effective dose to protein. I I subscribe to more of not a more is better indefinitely approach to protein, but more typically is prone to help the general population. And um, there's this myth going around that if, if you eat you know, a high protein diet. If you go much above the RDA, you're going to harm your, your bones and your kidneys and and your liver and all this stuff. And that's just simply not founded. That that's not true per the research evidence. Certainly if somebody has got chronic kidney disease, then you can build a case for hovering between um, the RDA and maybe a little bit above that, but there's still research showing that even up to 1.5 grams Per kilogram of body weight, if they're not in uh, any sort of advanced stage of chronic kidney disease, they'll still be just fine. Um, Protein for the general population, as well as the athletic population, um, optimizing it isn't all that different, man. It really all kind of converges on about double the RDA. So 1.6 grams per kilo or 0.7 grams per pound. And, And when we prescribe that, it's per unit of target body weight, not current body weight, unless you're happy with your current body weight, because you'll have some individuals with obesity going, oh crap, how am I supposed to, so you're telling me to consume 250 grams of protein a day. I'm like, well, now base it on your, your goal or ideal body weight. And then you'll have a, a, a reasonable intake of protein. Is there any benefit to going above that? Yes. Um, the, the benefit appears to be in, in, in people who resistance train anyway, the benefit appears to be fat loss <laughs> of all things. <laughs> that's a pretty and good benefit. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it's what incredible. most people initially, at least that come to us, mm-hmm. you know, we always say they come to us. Typically it's, it's at least a secondary goal of like, Hey, my back's a little sore. I like to play golf or whatever that is, or, you know, but mm-hmm. I also could stand to lose 10, 20, even more. Right. So it may be a a primary goal or maybe a secondary goal. So just increasing protein above that 0.7 per pound of ideal body weight, that could have some, some weight loss or I should say fat loss effects as well. It it, surprisingly and pleasantly 
it's a pleasant surprise that the results tend to default towards fat loss and muscle retention and or even slight muscle gains that don't happen to reach a degree of statistical significance with their small gains in muscle along with this fat loss. So it's, it's just almost this like miraculous recomposition type of phenomenon that happens with protein intakes that exceed 0.7 and, and inch towards the full gram per pound, the, 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 right. the mythical and, 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 uh, the legendary lore of a gram per pound that the bodybuilders have been telling us, uh, you know, since 1980, uh, there have been a series of experiments done by Jose Antonio and his colleagues um, out of Nova University. And they just have seen over the course of four or five, I, I believe five studies now, that there is just simply a tendency for body fat to decrease when you slam high amounts of protein. And this is in free living individuals who are training. So we're not talking about sedentary folks, uh, not doing any lifting. So we're talking about active lifting people. When you crank protein all the way up, it tends to subconsciously, um, drive down the other macros and, um, and, and the, whatever extra energy they, they may be taking in from the increased protein, they tend to put it towards, um, exercise, even at a subconscious level and uh some really good stuff happens body composition wise with that yeah that's really interesting i think uh, you know again i'm encouraged to to know at least we're somewhat in the in the right realm when we would discuss this with you know as a brand right as we take the brand to all these markets is that hey you know even as simple as like it increases your satiety a bit i mean like it's just not as much room for other stuff i mean eating a lot of protein is is makes you really full maybe it leads me to my next question um you know, you know, let's say that we prescribed even the, the, the 0.7 grams per pound of desired body weight, you know, a lot of folks in the real world are going to look at you and think, man, there's no way I can eat all of that protein. Is yeah. it in the research and in your studies, have you seen supplementation being part of that mix? And if so, is it as effective than if you mm -hmm. consumed all that protein with just animal or plant sources? Yeah, there's plenty of data showing that um just powdered protein whether you, you have whey or a combination of whey whey and casein um you know even the the plant-based protein powders soy and pea um they are all very effective at fulfilling the, the protein requirements and so um protein powder is almost like a cheat code <laughs> for <laughs> hitting your protein requirements in an economical and extremely easy and convenient way. So, um, and yeah, food prices are going, everything is going up. Creatine is like cocaine now, but, um, <laughs> certainly looks like, it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> not that I would know. Yeah. You, it does look like yeah. It. <laughs> you do get flagged in the airport for that stuff, but, um, bag, bag. <laughs> dude, I got, I got, I got, Popped for bringing protein powder to, um, oh gosh, uh, to, to my the most recent conference that that I was at. So it's like it's brown powder, man. There's no way that stuff's bad. Um, so exactly. anyway, <laughs> um, so so yeah, it, it protein powder is a legitimate um, source, a high quality source of protein. And uh, if, for example, and and. I'll just use, use what I do. For example, I, I do, I get at least 50 to 80 grams of my protein per day from protein powder. And, and so I get the, you know, and that represents about a third or, or, or a little more than a third of, of my protein from powder. And uh, there's, there's no issues with it. There's no, um, it's easy to digest. I've never experienced great protein powder and uh, it's high quality stuff. So, and it gets the job done. So if anybody is struggling with hitting their protein requirements, then they should definitely consider just simple protein powder. Yeah. Oh, again, I'm glad to hear that. That's always been our prescription. And like you, I'll do two 50 gram shakes a day. So that puts me at a hundred and then I'll eat maybe three meals at 40 to 50. So that's pretty mm -hmm. high. I'm at 225 mm -hmm. body weight. 
but mm -hmm. I, I feel great. I, I don't eat a ton of like sweets and snacks like I did when I didn't eat as much protein. So it's like the one nutritional strategy that seems to pay off the biggest, right? It's like the simplest thing to do with it seems to be certainly now that I've heard, hey, there's even some some research that would show it has a, a an effect on body fat reduction directly, right? Um, it seems to be the biggest payoff um, for lots of reasons. So I'm glad to hear that that uh, you know supplementation is part of it. I want to shift yeah. gears for a minute. This is going to be a, a bit different. So. Um, nutrition is a crazy subject, almost religious in some ways. It's like yeah. an ideology, right? If you're mm -hmm. a vegan, it's like, you know, everyone knows it. And if you're a keto or a, I mean, geez, man, we could just go down the, the list, right? Of all the mm -hmm. different diets. So I've noticed on some of your posts, you know, like you're the guy, like to me, like you're the, the end all be all source. Like nobody reads all the research. Nobody knows. Nobody's not beholden to other people. You'll post something. And then the comments are just off the chain. Ridiculous. Like the claims that people fly in with, like, who is this guy? Yeah. How can you claim to do this? And you always seem to handle those things with a lot of grace. So I want to prop you for that. First of all, because you do have the chops to just destroy someone if you wanted to, I know you a little or enough to know that you're not wired that way, but you handle that really well. So just tell me like, what's your lens on that overall? I mean, you've got all of mm -hmm. this research. You've got 20 plus years of deep dive research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When a internet guru person jumps on and just throws all sorts of shade at your ideas or questions who you are and what do you know, how do you handle it as gracefully as you do? <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for the acknowledgement. Um, it really feels good to know that somebody's freaking watching my struggles online, man. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> of course. It's really interesting, Rick, because I, I've just spent the last day and a half communicating with a lay person on Twitter about... Um, carbs and obesity. And so he made the claim. So he comes into a tweet that I did. And um, the tweet was actually a kind of a funny, entertaining tongue in cheek type of thing where um, you know how the liver King just got kind of got busted exposed for, um, I cannot believe PGs. that guy was on steroids. Let's just Shocker, go on the record right? saying how shocked we were. So shocked. I was like, no, Blown away. no, no way. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually know the guy who is, fr I know <clears throat> one of my friends is friends or at least acquainted with the coach who exposed those emails. Oh, interesting. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And and I have mixed feelings about that, man. As there's like, you know, certain uh codes of confidentiality, they shouldn't be okay. So may, maybe he's trying to help the greater good, right? Because you have yeah. this sort of this wrecking ball force in the world, you know, blah blah blah. But I don't know, man. I I uh I have mixed feelings about doing someone dirty like that with, with their emails. Unless it's gonna like save your your skin or you know save your family or something it's like yeah shit, I agree look like, like it's always salacious and fun when it comes out of course no one's surprised that, you know geez look at the guy it's like come on I mean I don't know a lot but Dude, I know that and if you injected but, uh, that guy's blood you. into anybody they would just get you know they would end up looking like one of those Belgian blue uh, uh, cows you know those the, the big muscle cows are those greyhounds that, that they lose that one enzyme yes. where they just get to, to rocked up greyhounds i'm like oh, it looks so right. crazy yes yeah, the myostatin the myostatin greyhound. yeah the myostatin, myostatin yeah, block yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. well I, i'm with you i don't i mean look i i buy into it as much as anyone it's just interesting because i'm in the industry and i like to work mm -hmm. out it's like oh this is amazing right but I'm with you. I don't, I don't agree with the exposing that. I mean, what's what's the point? You know, I mean, you could yeah, claim yeah. you're altruistically doing the right thing by the world because he's selling some, you know, organ meat, you know, dehydrated organ meat capsules or something. And, you know, <laughs> what, whatever. And, and OK, OK, fine. But at the end of the day, like I said, even your business. Right. That's a whole nother subject. But. You don't get caught up in that, right? And to your point, like you didn't, you didn't like, you didn't like that 
that that happened. So you, I am assuming, and you know, again, based on the little I know of you, you wouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> but how do you yeah, stay I didn't. above the fray from I, this just internet like banter and getting pulled down? Because it, you know, listen, you're pretty high profile, and you're getting more so, and so it can, it's only going to become more. And I hear people like that are that are in this world who over time, they just, they just like, I can't do it. I just post and ghost and you're good to get in there and interact, right? <laughs> I did, you interact man. with your, you interact with your folks, but when you get in there and you interact with people, especially the mm-hmm. bigger your profile gets, which it's going to, mm-hmm. um, there's just some crazy people in there. You know, there really are, and they, they can really yeah. bring you down. So how are you, how do you, and how yeah. are you going to stay above the fray? I, I must be a little bit uh, masochistic in some ways because um, I did comment on that that Liver King debacle. But what I did was I looked at the emails and saw that he consumed over 200 grams of sh- sugar a day. He was like, he's a product of the 90s. So back in the 90s, we were slamming a shite load of uh, uh, dextrose. Post workout, you know, we had our freaking post workout sugar to spike the insulin in the anabolic window. And this guy's training twice a day. So he was trying to spike the old insulin twice a day with a ton of sugar. And obviously, the guy's lean as hell. And so I just made the observation that, hey, first of all, uh, you know, it's implicit that his talking about being on keto, well, that wasn't true. But, um, right. He's a lean son of a gun year round, slamming massive amounts of sugar. And why is that? Oh, well, it's pretty elementary. It's because he's not running an unused caloric surplus that's getting stored in the adipose tissue. And people don't, they either don't know that or they refuse to accept that. And so that was the point of my tweet. And then somebody came in, not a researcher, not a figure in the industry, a literal rando, just a guy who probably um, has a has a job in, I don't know, security somewhere. I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe some dude who sells real estate. Who knows? Some, something completely unrelated to uh, the, the field, to the biosciences. And he decides to just argue with me. And his name is James Watkins, by the way. He, this is on Twitter. <laughs> okay. I love it. And, and I decided to just, you know what? There's nothing inherently wrong with with talking to people and trying to teach, and you know I've got a plat a platform a public platform where there's lurkers who can learn, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to communicate with this guy in good faith and see what I can teach him and all of the the lurkers in the process, and so he's claiming that. This was his first claim, and his claims kept evolving as I kept refuting them. So instead of them getting refuted and him acknowledging, oh, okay, I just learned something new, got it, and then proceeding to take off the teacher hat and then put on the student hat and ask me questions, what he ended up doing was just every time he got refuted and shot down and just literally owned uh, for a false claim, he just moved on to the next thing that he tried to own me back on just to retaliate. Right. And it's just so bad because he's waving around a butter knife and here I've got my freaking M16 going, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. go. <laughs> and it's like, I'm trying to be gentle throughout the whole thing. I'm trying to be civil, but it's, it's really fascinating, Rick. I mean, he, he made the claim that you don't want to be spiking your blood sugar because when you eat carbohydrates, you get a blood glucose spike and then your insulin goes up and insulin is the fat storage hormone. So if you're trying to lose weight, you got to avoid these blood sugar spikes because of insulin. And then I'm like, okay, all right. So what evidence do you have that it's these blood sugar spikes and these insulin spikes that prevent fat loss? prevent body fat reduction. What, what evidence do you have for that? And that's always the first question. Whenever you want to engage with somebody in a scientific discussion, it's really a a matter of sharing scientific evidence because um, a lot of times you end up learning something new because it's impossible to have looked at all the damn scientific evidence out there. So in good faith, you ask, okay, that's interesting. Well, could, could I see the evidence for that? 
And so his evidence was linking a blog, a freaking blog article by Jason Fung. I'm like, oh God, he, he, okay. I'm dealing with somebody who is obviously a layperson, but he's a layperson who has zero standard of evidence. He has no concept of weak evidence, okay evidence, very strong evidence. He has no concept of, of the hierarchy of what constitutes evidential strength. You know, what's compelling here? So I, I kind of knew what I was getting into, but like I said, I'm, I'm kind of masochistic apparently, but I do like to try to teach the lurkers along the way. So I knew it right. was going to be one of those scenarios. And so I just kind of had fun with it. And I said, all right, so I asked you to provide the evidence and you provided me a blog editorial written by essentially a random guru author. Because that's what a Jason Fung is. I mean, he's he's a he's a nephrologist, but he do, he doesn't respect science, and he has not shown that he can support his claims with science. He's one of these calorie denier folks. It's like, okay, those are the flat earthers of the nutrition world. <laughs> um, it's like that's the best <laughs> analogy there. There is it's so damn accurate, and so um, he got a little bit disgruntled. When I said, oh, your evidence, that's not good evidence. A blog article is not good evidence. And so what he did was he dug through PubMed. He probably did a search on you know, carbohydrates and calories and you know, something like that. You know, And so he found a, an article, a, a narrative review from 2005. And he puts it up there and says, hey, this article says that calories don't matter. And it's low carb diets that, that cause greater weight loss. Aha, I gotcha. And then I'm like, well, here's the problem. Here's the problem, James Watkins. Um, <clears throat> in order for you to blame carbohydrates as the culprit for obesity, you have to show diet comparisons that controlled calories and protein. And the only variable that was disparate in the comparison is carbohydrates. That's what you have to show. And there's exactly zero studies in your narrative review paper that you linked that demonstrate that exactly zero. And then he just starts getting more and more disgruntled. He's well, like, he starts, he starts getting emotional. He starts throwing out the names, the name calling this all this just begins. Um, <laughs> and so I try to calm him down. I'm like, look, dude, calm down, take the focus off of me. Let's focus on the topic. Um, what you need to do is realize that you're making claims, but you're not backing them up. It's super duper easy to spout off a bunch of claims, but you have to bring evidence. And, and so <laughs> what he ends up doing is, um, he just, you know, get, throws a few more ad hominems. And, and I, I'm like, look, here's what we can do. I'm going to send you this paper. I'm I, so I linked the position stand of the International Society of Sports Nutrition on diets and body composition. And this is something that I authored um, in 2017. And so I said, please read this. You know, let's 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 kind of wipe the slate clean. Let's let's make this a learning thing. Because I genuinely love teaching people, but he his motive is to try to win an argument on the internet, while my motive is to try to educate. And so it's a really interesting right. dynamic, but even though he's not learning Jack crap, he's just trying to internet, you know, keyboard warrior me, the lurkers are learning, which is cool. Right. And so, um, sure enough, he apparently skims the, the position stand, the paper that I linked. And then he says, ah, this paper references this meta analysis showing that, look, look at this. And so it was a meta-analysis, um, a 2014, 2015 meta-analysis by Clifton and colleagues that showed that higher protein intakes are associated with uh, greater fat loss. And so I responded to him by saying, oh, that's cool that you linked Clifton's meta-analysis, but that's not the point you were making. You weren't right. saying that higher protein is more conducive to fat loss. You were saying that carbohydrate is the bad guy. 
So you need to listen to my responses more carefully when I ask you to post something that is isocaloric and isonitrogenous, so matched in protein. And then he just starts getting more frustrated, more belligerent, because we're like four or five exchanges deep where at every turn, I'm just refuting him. And, and he's beginning to feel like a fool. And so he just resorts to saying, ah, so, oh, I, I see now you, I wonder how much big food pays you to say that um, oh, carbohydrates didn't on, get people of fat. All people, of all how, people, how right? you're in the pocket of big food because you know, you're, you're, you're probably, <laughs> he invokes the food guide pyramid. He's like, he's like, oh yeah, you're, what? you're a researcher. You know, you're going to tell me to follow the food guide pyramid. And I'm like, dude, link me exactly to where I, I said anything good about the pyramid. And then he ignores that. And then he comes back and he posts a graph showing the rise of obesity from the seventies until 2008. Okay. So yeah, obesity. So these are all up. unrelated, right? <laughs> totally. or, or to the point. So he is uh. desperate. He's desperate at this point. He, he posts the graph showing the rise of obesity and he says, see, look, because of the food guide pyramid, obesity is up. And, and of course, um, since the graph only goes to like 2008, you begin to see um, this sort of drop off in obesity in the sort of this dip down in the uh, early 2000s that, that happened. Okay, so we'll set that aside for a second. So I came back with a graph showing obesity all the way up to 2018. So he, he already screwed up. He doesn't post the latest data. I'm like, all right, man, if we're going to play the correlation game, let's at least post the latest data. So I posted the, the latest data on the um, uh, historical trend in obesity, showing that indeed it's going up even past 2008, all the way up into 2018. And then I posted carbohydrate intake from during the pyramid time until now, decrease, wheat intake, wheat flour in, intake, decrease, sugar intake, decrease. I'm like, dude, you're going to lose the freaking correlation game too. So right. are where are we at? Are you just going to ignore this now and then move on to the next claim? Sure enough, he did. And and um, I'm like, you know what? It's been fun. Good I luck. was about to say, man, you're you're such a patient person. <laughs> I'm glad you used the lens. This is what I was going to say. Like a, a lay person or a casual, you know, uh, person that might be interested in nutrition or exercise, they're going to read your points, and it's going to be educational, right? And they see the lunacy that's on the other side of that argument. So I'm glad you do it for that reason. But I got to tell you, man, at scale, as you continue to grow, that's going to be really tough to do. And I really feel bad for you because when I read it. <laughs> I, I, it, it reinforces <laughs> what I know about you, which is like, well, he's very calm. He's a really good guy. He has a lot of data. That would be like me, like, bo you know, like being braggadocious and stepping into the tee box with like Tiger Woods and being like, all right, let's do this. Right. Or stepping in the <laughs> yeah. ring with like Mayweather yeah. and being like, let's yeah. see who hits who first. That's like <laughs> getting into an argument with Alan Aragon online about research and how to read it and i mean it's like why would you do that but that just proved i mean case in point it goes to prove this person's not fully lucid and, and understanding of who they're dealing with but i think it's hilarious but i'm glad you i'm glad you do that to the degree that you're comfortable because it, i think it is educational so when you mentioned that word like the lurkers are there right i think you're right yeah. i think they read that and they're like because when i read those things i'm like wow you know hey this person's crazy i kind of feel bad for you but at the same time, I'm learning through all of your responses. Plus, it's teaching me that you're more trustworthy than ever. You do have your sources and your shit together. So I think there's probably some merit to that at a small scale so that you don't go crazy, right? Because it, there are so many, you, you just can't, you can't argue with hardly anyone these days. But I think if you strategically pick those, it's just more opportunity to double down on sure. what you're good at yeah. and, and prove that you're a trustworthy source that does have you know, great references and, and vets them correctly. So <laughs> well, I, I, I can assure you, you it, Rick, <laughs> I can assure you, Rick, I, I limit these kind of melees. I uh, maybe I'll do it once. Uh, um, I think it's come down to like once a 
once every couple months, I would say that I, yeah. I get really kind of dedicate some, some time to, to arguing with, with somebody, even if I know that they're not um, arguing in good faith. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I did, I have had a recent argument that was a good faith argument with um, a guy named Simon Hill, who I mentioned earlier, and it was a good faith argument. We even took it to DM and um, talked out some of the nuances that are a little bit uh, less prone to be displayed when you're kind of posturing for the public and stuff. And so um, I think the discourse is great, but for sure, man, I, I, I hear you. I, if I spent all day arguing with guys who just want to argue and they're, you know, they're on Twitter and they have all day to do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a pretty bad, bad life at the end of the, the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't do it, man. I, I, yeah. I, I need you to keep your shit together because I appreciate what you do. I don't want I'm you jumping off a bridge I'm glad you're looking out, man. <laughs> looking out for you for sure. Good looking um, out, bro. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, listen, um, thanks for your time. I have one final question for you. Um, it's kind of a loaded question. So it may, it may take some effort. So if you had one piece of advice, nutritional or exercise wise, that you feel it would be most valuable for the world, what mm -hmm. would it be? Okay. I'm going to have to do both nutrition and exercise. So sounds good. Um, okay. So nutrition, don't eat too much, but make sure you get enough protein. Love it. Um, exercise. Don't do too much, but make sure there's resistance training in there. <laughs> Love it, dude. That was um, good. I'm like, with all that yeah. knowledge in your head, I'm like, this might, this might literally blow him, blow his head right off. It's like <laughs> one thing. Yeah, that yeah. was very succinct. So I, I, appreciate was, it. I tried to, I tried to make it real. Like, real uh, I got so much. Uh, okay, I know but that. Well, once again, it, it's it's sort of our prescription for you know the the target age avatar that we're going for. So. I'm pleased to hear that. But listen, man, you're a real treasure. Um, I've been a fan, obviously, for a long time. Um, if somebody wants to follow you, consume your information, buy your books, I recommend all of the above. Where can they get a hold of you, Alan? Well, thank you so much, Rick. Um, people can reach me at alanaragon.com. Uh, my largest audience platform is, is Instagram. It's not TikTok yet, no matter how, how the world is going. They seem to be loving the TikTok, but I'm not quite, I'm not quite blown up on TikTok yet. <laughs> it's something that I had to kind of have maybe a mental block against, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm most active on probably on Instagram and, and my handles on social media is the same handle. It's, it's the Alan Aragon and website is alanaragon.com. Um, I, I want to put in a plug for, uh, once again, for this webinar that I'm doing on January 21st. And I'm doing that with three other great professionals um, in their respective specialties. And I'm super duper excited about that because it's gonna be something that people can attend and it doesn't cost a fortune and it could definitely change change their lives. So so yeah, you, you can find out the something details. that um, consumers, just, just every ever, average everyday citizens could attend as well. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's, awesome. it's a, it's a, an online thing. You don't have to be an expert to attend it and you can find it on my website on the, uh, the speaking page. So, so alanaragon.com slash speaking, and then it'll be, it'll be on the list of, of events that I'm doing. And awesome. um, of course, uh, as you mentioned and very graciously, thank you. Um, my research review is, is my baby thing that I've been nurturing for the last 15 years. And uh, it's something that I feel is kind of the legacy, a big part of the legacy that, that I, I would leave to the game. You know, a, a lot of uh, my most astute followers and students have their own research reviews now. And so the fitness space is a matter of, you know, having a research review now, apparently, uh, which is something that I started in, in 2008. And um, I'm glad that you're giving me credit for that because 
the things that we start, the things that we pioneer, they get lost in the generations and nobody knows where they came from or who started them. So I'm super grateful to you, Rick, for actually bringing that up and acknowledging that and for being a subscriber for as long as you have. But hey, look how successful you are. Look how awesome you are. So I'm sure the correlation is there, man. It is. Listen, and, and at the at that rate, I think I've spent like maybe $212 on it in 15 years because your rates are yeah. too inexpensive. So I'm officially, for anyone that might be angry with me, going to be responsible for Alan raising his rates because there's way too much value <laughs> in his newsletter. I'm He's way undercharging. <laughs> but listen, you guys, check him out. Alan, you're a treasure, man. I can just say thank you thank for you. all you do for our industry. Um, please keep going. I'm a fan and we will continue to promote and follow you.